there's some European countries that brag about how they have completely eliminated Down syndrome from their nation. If you have a Down syndrome baby in the womb, you're supposed to abort them. That is their cure for that. You can say you can't do it because they have a certain disability or they're a certain gender or they're a certain race. That's discrimination. So this is a wonderful act to protect the most innocent among us from discrimination. The pro-life issue is not a partisan issue. This is a moral issue. That is why we as Christians can take a stand, and I don't care if you've got a D or an R or an I or whatever behind your name. This is the most innocent among all of us. So this is a good bill. Hope you'll write that down. House Bill 5. At the bottom, you'll see that some of the different representatives sponsored that bill. And speaking of sponsors, one of the things you can do when you call is say, hey, I would like you to sponsor that bill. Because the more sponsors, the better chance it gets to pass. Now, a senator cannot sponsor a House bill and vice versa. Keep that in mind. But somebody willing to put their sponsorship on something that they can, that really is support. House Bill 5, good. Here's another one. House Bill 148. Everybody knows that I believe it was 1973. Pause for a second. We have another representative joining us, Representative James Tipton. Representative Tipton, what counties do you represent? <laughs> All right. Another one of our Christian lawmakers. Believe it or not, we actually have some. All right. <laughs> I wish we had more. Please send more of them to us. I believe it was 1973 that the Supreme Court made a law making abortion legal in the United States. You have to remember, nowhere in the Constitution does it ever give the court the authority to make law. So when somebody asks you, when did Congress pass the law making it legal, they never did. The court, unelected, they like to say, we have three separate and equal branches of government. That is incorrect twice over. We have three separate branches. We do not have three equal branches. That has never been the way it has been designed. The most powerful branch is the one the founding fathers gave the longest article in the Constitution to, Article 1, which means most power should be with the Congress. The second longest is the Article 2, dealing with the executive, and the shortest article is the one about the courts. And the court does not actually think that they're equal. They think they are superior to the legislative and executive because they're like, I don't care if you voted for it. I don't care if you signed it. I'm telling you that you can't do that. And you have an unelected group doing this. It's also not a lifetime appointment. Oh, Ruth Ginsburg. And throughout American <laughs> history, there have been multiple federal judges that have been removed by Congress and the presidents. Because Article 3 says that judges serve during terms of good behavior. And we have had different judges throughout American history that have been removed from their positions, one for being publicly drunk, another one for cursing during a court session, and the third one for beating his wife. And there have been more than 17 judges removed throughout American history. We have Justice Ginsburg, who hasn't been seen for weeks, and hasn't stayed awake for months or years during a court case, I do not think that is a term of good behavior. So there is actually a principle to get rid of that. And that's something our legislators hope you remember for our state Supreme Court as well. Thought I'd throw that in for free. So Roe versus Wade is when the Supreme Court made up a law and said abortion is no longer a state issue. It's now nationally illegal. Well, there's been a lot of push about this the last few days. Some of the pro-life cases now that are being ruled on will no doubt be pushed up to the Supreme Court. And if Justice Ginsburg is replaced, Lord help us. If we get another pro-life person in there, we will have enough to overturn that in our lifetime. This bill, praise the Lord. Let us be praying for that. It wouldn't hurt you to fast and pray. Lord, I did more than just think about it. I fasted, I prayed, and I did so. This bill, 148, would say, if the Supreme Court reverses Roe versus Wade, that does not make abortion illegal in America. That means it goes back to the way it was before, and that was an issue to be decided by each state. This would say that Kentucky Day 1 is an anti-abortion state. I would love to get that through, because that way if we get a complaint to the court, immediately we're abortion-free. So, wonderful pro-life bill, House Bill 148. When you call, because I know you're going to call, and I hope the husband calls, and then the wife calls. And if you got some older kids, have a kid call. Don't do it all at once. Both by those calls. You can combine. You don't have to call separately for every bill. You can say I'll, 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 several of them together. 
Now here's a very good bill. This is Senate Bill 9 called the Heartbeat Bill, saying if you have a car accident, let's say, and the paramedics show up, then the first thing they're going to do if you're laying out there from the accident is they're going to check to see if you have a pulse, you have a heartbeat, because that is a sign of life. Well, this says that if you can detect a heartbeat or the baby in the womb, that is a sign of life. There is a living person. Don't Jesus. kill it. You can detect a heartbeat, I believe, within the first two to four weeks. I mean, it's very early on in the process. The heartbeat bill, this has already been passed by two or three states. It's in the court. And it doesn't really matter what decision the courts give. Because whichever side wins, the other side's going to move it up to the next higher level. So if there was court cases that came out about this yesterday, it will continue to move up. It's a matter of prayer and a good pro-life bill here in Kentucky. I am proud to say, now you've all heard about what's going on in New York and Virginia. I've even heard them say that after the laid on a table, and then the mother and doctor can talk about if they're going to execute it. Already poor. Well, praise God, we don't have any pro-abortion bills in Kentucky this year. Praise God. You notice I didn't call it pro I called it pro-abortion. They had a choice nine, ten months ago. And people all say, what about the rape cases? Do you know how an incredibly small number that really is? And what about the life of the mother? We had a guy testify here years ago. He's like, I've been an OBG, whatever it is, baby doctor, 45 years. He's like, I have had one case where the mother's life was at risk. One in 45 years of practice. That also happens, but it's an incredibly small percentage. All right, let's talk about another bill. Senate Bill number 50. Senate Bill 50, there's different drugs that a doctor can prescribe that will induce a miscarriage, induce an abortion. This bill would, would say, if you're going to do that, doctor, you have to keep a list of the different people you prescribe this to, how many times you've done it, and this list has to be sent in to the state every once in a while. Because there's some people that are running health clinics and know it's just an abortion clinic. That's all that it is. So this would help cut down on that, and if they fail, the proper paperwork, it doesn't stop them from doing this, because that's against the law currently, but it would just make it a little more cumbersome and hopefully cut down on it. I don't know why we've made abortion cheap, fast, and easy. And adoption is a long time, a hard process, and it's very expensive. Did you know even to this day, we still send Planned Parenthood $500 million of your tax money. Your tax money is paying for abortions today, $500 million. Why are we funding a private company? Why is a private company paying all of this money? Why is this funding adoption? For people who go through a process and get approved, why are we only funding the one and not the other? That's discrimination to one side, and they're not supposed to do that, are they? I just thought I'd throw that in for free. Two on that. Senate Bill 50, the abortion prescriptions, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that is actually already passed the Senate and has now been sent over to the House of Representatives. To be honest, for the pro-life bills, I am not concerned about you leaving a message for your senator. If you want to, that's great. There are 38 senators in Kentucky, and I think about 29 of them are pro-life. So it's going to get through the Senate. Amen. Our battle is not even getting it through the House. Our battle is getting it to come up for a vote. That is the big battle of where they need to be encouraged, why you need to contact your representative, have them sponsor those good House bills. And Mr. Osborne, Mr. Osborne, really like you to bring that up for a vote. Now, here's a bad one. House Bill 164, the sodomite agenda. I've had people before at churches where I'm preaching, they're like, well, what is that? That is a good Bible word. That is the Bible word for homosexuals. And House Bill 164 would give special protections to those in the sodomite agenda. It says if I'm a homosexual or a transgender person, you must be required to make me a cake, to take the picture and all that, make me the t-shirt and things like that. The nation's attention has been focused on Kentucky at the front of this battle. We had, of course, the county clerk, Kim Davis, went to jail over that. She's like, I will hold my ground. By the way, did you know that happened during the summer? One of the very first things the legislature did in January when they went back in the session is they say she doesn't have to do that. They changed that law. Of course, Preston tell you about that. And we had a case of a t-shirt company in Lexington, and they're like, they wanted to have some homosexual event, and they said, well, we're a Christian group, we won't make the t-shirts for you, but we do recommend these other companies who will. And they took them to court saying, we want to force you to do that. They won that case, but you never hear when we win. This would reverse all of that and say, no, you have to. Isn't it amazing that there's groups of people saying, if you wear a red hat that says, make America great, we can deny you service at our restaurant and kick you off an airplane. However, you have to allow anybody on our side into your business. Well, isn't that just one side? The Constitution is amazing that the liberals say 
that you have the right to an abortion, but that is actually nowhere in the Constitution. But at the same time, they say you don't have a right to carry a weapon, and that is in the Constitution. Oh, so I just thought I'd throw that in, too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brother Lee Watson. I approve this message. This is the homosexual agenda, the transgender movement. Some people like, well, Brother Lee, I don't know about all of that. But let me give you not my opinion. My opinion is not worth a hill beat. Sometimes I'll get a legislator ask me, Brother Lee, what about this bill? What about that bill? I always answer the same way. The Bible says this. Biblical principle about that. Brother Lee's opinion doesn't matter. What? The Bible says, I want to turn over to the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, maybe 28. Those three verses. That is New Testament. It says this lifestyle is unnatural. If someone says it's natural, the Bible specifically says it is unnatural. It says it is vile, unnatural, vile, something else, two out of, I can remember two out of three in the book. But that's what the Bible specifically says about this lifestyle in the church. All right, this isn't the ancient. If you read the Old Testament, it talks about that in some of the punishments. Remember, that is going to correctly interpret your Bible. You must know when it was written and who was it written to. The moral principles never change. As far as the laws and the rituals, that was written to the ancient nation of Israel, of which we are not. God's moral law and his moral principles have never changed. That is what God says on the matter. That is not what Brother Lee says. So this is something, and all these bad bills, they all have the words, those who identify as a So they're really pushing this gender identity. By the way, there are multiple sexual preferences. That is a fact. There are only two genders. I don't care if you have an operation. That does not change your chromosome. You have two X's, you're a female. You have an X and a Y, you're a male. And there are zero extra options. No matter what surgery you have, how you dress, how you act, that does not change that. Because you are lying to me saying you're something else. Don't expect me to be a liar back. Let's move on. The spanking bill, House Bill 82 would say that anybody in a public school, religious school, or private school, by the way, today is Christians and homeschool day at the Capitol. All homeschools legally in Kentucky are defined as a private school. And this law specifically forbids private schools from exercising any physical discipline against a student. It doesn't say necessarily even spanking. Physical discipline. If I grab you away from the hot stove, I say, don't, I told you, I'm doing that. That is physical discipline. This is very, very dangerous. This violates biblical principles. And you can be disciplined without abuse. And I'm a living example of that. So this is, I think, very dangerous. And I think this is a bad bill. House Bill number 82. It only has one sponsor, but I just didn't want that for the slide. How are we doing on time? We are doing, here we go, two different bills that deal with the same thing. House Bill 136 and Senate Bill 80. These deal with the legalization of marijuana in Kentucky. The guy who's really pushing this is saying publicly, repeatedly, that he wants to have full recreational use. He's like, we'll try medical, that's great, but he wants full recreational use. You can stand in the street and smoke a joint. That's the liberal agenda over there in Colorado, California. Now, you can't stand on the street corner and drink a juice box out of a straw, but you can stand on the street corner and smoke a joint. That's the crazy mentality. And they want to tell you that it's good for you. Well, I've got two things for you here today. Before you leave, I hope you come up to the desk. I've had a little pamphlet printed out. I had the group pushing this call me up and say, Brother Lee, we would like you to help us with this. I say, I know you've already been spoken today. You think I'm going to help you. But they're like, but this is good. And you've been told misinformation. So I said, I promise you this. I will do my homework. So I went. I spent several months research, reading articles, doing homework. You would like to find out what I found. Go to my website, which is listed in the program. Everyone should have got it. I have several others. There's a 45 to 50 minute documentary of what I found. You will notice nowhere in here does it say this is opinion of Brother Lee. The other group likes to cite these different doctors. They'll cite an individual doctor. They'll cite a study from a group you've never heard of. I cite people like the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Association, the American Medical Association, the American Lung Association. The American Psychiatric Association, all of them publicly said we have studied this and this is bad as a medicine. We oppose the medical use of marijuana. Now you have the groups come up here and say it is good, and you got out of 99% of them have had zero medical training at all. And they're saying, even though the American Medical Association says we did study it and it is bad, we cannot recommend it. I'm smarter than they are, and you shouldn't listen to this. Let me give you just a few of the highlights of this. Cancer. This is a quote 
from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and I fully cite where you can find all of these things today. This is what they said, quote, researchers have found an association between marijuana smoking and testicular cancer. Here is from the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. They say of the 70 cancer-causing chemicals in tobacco, no, this is the American Thoracic Foundation, 30 of the 70 cancer-causing chemicals in tobacco, 30 of them are in marijuana. Now, here's the thing that they love to pull up. They like to pull up two different groups pushing this. First of all, they want to bring up sick people. And they're like, people who have cancer and have to go through some of the treatments, they get severe nausea. And that is true. A lot of cancer treatments cause severe nausea. And they're like, if you take the marijuana, then it settles your nausea, and you're actually able to get something to eat. That is also true. So that sounds like this would be a good treatment for people going through cancer treatments. Here's the problem with that. It feeds 30 different forms of cancer when you smoke it. So you feel good for the next 30 minutes to an hour. However, you just fed the cancer that you're trying to fight. And that's something going on in the body that you didn't see. I love to use this as an example. If you have a fever, the ironic part of a fever is while your body is too hot, feel cold. That's the great irony. So if you're like me and you got a 100, 102 fever, I'm a very bad patient. And every husband should say amen because you're the same way. And your wife's nudging you right now. You get 100, 102, you feel cold, you're running too hot. I know what I like to do. I like to jump into a hot shower or I like to get underneath a blanket or electric blanket and warm myself up. Now, if you have a fever and you get under the electric blanket or in a hot shower, you have actually raised your body temperature even higher, which is the absolute worst thing you can do for your body. But how do you feel after you jump out of that shower? I feel better. Same trick on the mind. You're making your body into thinking, I feel better, when you've actually fed the very thing that is hurting you. That is the danger of this thing treating cancer. And why are we waging a war against tobacco causing cancer when this, they're like, we have found it. Is there 30 cancer-causing agents? Road safety. Well, they tried this over in Washington State. This is the American Automobile Association report talking about the year after they did that. Fatal road crashes involving marijuana double after Washington State legalizes drugs. Now you got to worry about that. The drunks? Well, if you never smoke it, you still have now double fatal road crashes. That's if I never even smoked this stuff. This is the University of Colorado School of Medicine, May 15, 2014. Fatal motor vehicle crash in Colorado increased dramatically since the commercialization of medical marijuana for their recreation have increased dramatically since it was medically approved. Everybody heard about the Oxycontin debacle. They were all hooked on that. The guy who ran the pharmaceutical company for Oxycontin was a guy by the name of John Stewart. He now runs a medical marijuana company. Same old tricks. Same guy running it. They haven't changed anything. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, marijuana does lead to increased risk for stroke. According to the Journal of the American Heart Association, 2016, marijuana smoke does as much damage to the heart as tobacco smoke. According to the Journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, in case studies of adolescents admitted to hospitals due to strokes following marijuana use, the study concluded marijuana may cause stroke and death. And you can get addicted to this stuff, too. The crowd pushing it wants to say, oh, it's not addictive. I had a guy in this room, and well, it might have been one of the other committee rooms. I was sitting back there, and they're having a hearing on it, and he says, it's not addictive. I've smoked it for 20 years. It's not addictive. That's the crowd I'm dealing with here. All right. <laughs> Y'all need to pray for me. I bet I lost another half inch of hair that day. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, one in 10 marijuana users will become addicted. Will. It is addictive. It is a gateway drug. I'll give you two others, and then I'll three others. This is from the Kentucky Narcotic. They said the largest percentage of medical marijuana card holders in California are people ages 19 to 24. I wonder how many of them have black hole. And then I will just give you one other. Please get one of these. It cites all the sources. These are organizations that you have, the most reputable, well-known medical institutions in our nation. I do see people who quote places we never heard of or groups that seem to be one issue talking about it. If it was so great, how come I don't see medical organizations lobbying for it. I'll see individual doctors who want to get rich. I do not see any medical organizations at all coming to lobby for this. And the last one I want to talk about is the veterans. This is from the Journal of the American Psychiatric Association. This is their position statement on marijuana. Quote, there is no scientific evidence that marijuana is beneficial for the treatment of any psychiatric disorder, like post-traumatic stress disorder. 
In contrast, there is evidence supporting a strong association of cannabis use with the onset of psychiatric disorder. I believe it was this very death receipt last year that the current Secretary of State, Alison Lovick and Grimes, said that this will be very good for our veterans. Never served today for her life. I am a veteran. On top of that, I am a combat veteran. Multiple awards, medals, and a citation for valor for my actions in the world. So when I'm talking about people who've been through the stuff and these people who have reached that PTSD, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about us. If anybody has a right to talk about it, it's one of us. And if these guys who have this real problem on traumatic stress disorder, and you say, well, I want to give you this marijuana, and you can smoke that, that'll help you. If you smoke it, you'll be high for about two hours. At the end of those two hours, have we done anything to address your problem? You have all of the problems you had two hours ago. You have not had any counseling to make it better. In fact, we said, don't even, don't think about it. We're not going to do anything to make it better, except I'm going to expose you to 30 different forms of cancer, and one in 10 of you vets is going to get addicted to this stuff. You shouldn't even drive or make any decisions, big decisions, when you're on it. And for two hours, I'm just going to fry your brain. And you'll have all the problems you had before. That is not helping our vets get over this. That is not giving them any treatment. It's the exact opposite. As a combat veteran, I'm insulted by all those who would dare say it. So this is a horrible bill. I'm not actually worried about this passing this year, believe it or not. But I can tell you the crowd pushing this is the most active, aggressive group probably lobbying the legislature today. I have two legislators here. You guys agree with that statement or am I wrong? They are very active. They are very aggressive. And they got a lot of problems. Let you know the stronger it's not going to push back. It's going to make it want to call. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, that's the different spots. While I'm not worried about passing this year, they are building momentum. They had a big rally two days ago. And in the rally, they said, yes, we just turned three more votes today. They're going to get enough to get this thing passed one day. They don't hear from you. They're only going to hear from the other side. Read the pamphlet. Oh, I'm only down a few minutes. i got to hurry. Church money, Senate Bill 59, House Bill 28. This would say different non-profit organizations, such as churches. If you have fundraising activities, not your normal tithes and offerings, but fundraising activities that you wouldn't have to pay sales tax or use tax on that. And I think that's good. The pastor doesn't call the governor up and say, hey, where's your tithe? And the governor shouldn't be calling the church saying, hey, where's your tax? Stay out of each other's pocket. They love this idea of separation of church and state one way. They don't like it the other direction, though. They think that's perfectly fine. These are gun restrictions. They want to take away your guns and have severe background checks. Let anybody cross the border and don't bother to check them. But American citizens, these stringent, severe gun restrictions, you can't take it here, you can't buy it there. I don't have really time because I've only got three minutes left to get into that. But those are about that. If you want to talk about any of these bills and read them, remember, just type in LRC. And it will take you right there, and there's that button that says legislation. And you can look it up by number. You can look up bills by who's the sponsor, and all kinds of ways. and find out who voted for it, who's sponsoring it, all, where is it at right now, what committee is it in. Full helpful site. Hate crimes. These are different bills that would say these different crimes. And we want to say if there's this, a judge decides that this crime was done as a hate crime, that it be classified in addition to what it already is, and there's additional punishments. I, as a Christian, am very, very wary of this. Because you have those groups who want to say what I preach and what I've already said here today is hate, and it should be a crime. And I'm very aware that they want to start this, and one day, it, where is it going to lead? All right? The crimes they are mentioning are already crimes and punishments. I don't want to stay away from these hate crimes that a judge can decide kind of arbitrarily. Senate Bill 19, so, um, he says he wants to be able to sell alcohol in the state parks. He doesn't care if it's dry county or not. In fact, there's a special provision in the bill saying even if it is a dry county, no city or county may vote to override. And basically he wants to make all of Kentucky wet through the state parks. I believe it's against liquor. I've had people come and say, well, if you're against marijuana, why don't you preach against liquor? I know! Bad wicked. I've never seen anything good come out of it. That's the bill to make all of Kentucky wet in one fail swoop through the state parks. House Bill 49 and 46 say we would put our national motto in a prominent location in all Kentucky schools. Right? And our, amen. our national motto is not E Pluribus Unum. The official U.S. motto is In God We Trust. Passed by the Congress, signed by the President back in the 50s, and I say we ought to put it up there. Praise the Lord for that. Let's see, and then miscellaneous, because I know I'm out of time and I'm out of time. Having a national day of prayer for students in Kentucky schools. And it will be the last Wednesday of September. They want to change the voting age in local elections to 16. Uh, no. And at 16, I don't, I'm not really happy about the driving. Let alone vote for the charge. Gambling expansion. 
the socialists are really pushing this $15 per hour minimum wage. If the unskilled labor is getting $15 an hour, what do you think skilled labor like your plumber or your electrician should charge? Absolutely crazy, massive inflation for that. The term limit bill, limit terms for the legislators 12 years, I think that is a good thing. If they take a term off, it would reset their clock. I think that is a great idea. It was designed to be a citizen's legislature, not a professional legislature. Because you get people up here who lose touch with the people. So I think 12 years is enough to pass on institutional knowledge and would prevent that good old boy system. More gun access and no sanctuary cities in Kentucky. Right. Yes. Praise the Lord for that. America was built on legal immigration. The immigrants came over to Ellis Isle. You know what they had to do? They were immigrating legally. And at that time, there was no welfare state. They came over knowing I either work or I starve. So they came over here and they built the great nation because they worked. I thought I'd throw that in extra. Phone number is at the top. This is your last opportunity to write that down. You now have 15 minutes to change rooms. Please go see all the candidates. I've got all these big candidates. There's three people in there. And I hope you enjoy the day. Hi, I'm Dr. Frank Simon. I'm an allergist and family doctor, board certified in both allergy and internal medicine. I specialize in allergy, headaches, sinus, hives, cough, asthma, hypertension, and diabetes. We're located at 1404 Browns Lane near Norton Suburban Hospital. Our phone number is 895-5088. We can see you tomorrow. I want to say first thank you all for being with us today. We very much appreciate you taking time to come up to your Capitol building. Very honored for this day. That is comprised of three counties, Montgomery County, Mount Sterling, Kentucky, Powell County, consists of Stanton, Clay City, Kentucky, and Menifee County, which is Frenchburg, Kentucky. I actually live in the smallest of those three counties, which is Menifee County, a very small rural county here in Kentucky. I am a full-time pastor. I have been the senior pastor at the church that I have been at now for 21 plus years. I have been there since 1998, serving as a senior pastor. I don't know what everybody's faith is in here. I belong to the Pentecostal Church of God organization, so I'm a Pentecostal preacher. Don't let that scare you, so don't leave. <laughs> I am very honored to be a part of this today. I ran for office in 2014 as for the state legislature, that district, for the very first time of ever seeking a public office. I never held a local office. I had never even ran for a local office. I had been approached on opportunities by individuals that actually wanted me to run for some of the local positions, but I didn't feel at the time that was what I needed to be doing. God began to deal with my heart about two years before I ever decided to run for office. I began to pray about that. Me and my wife, which is sitting in the audience there, my wife is named Sheila Hale. She's the biggest fan I've got. She is a great part of my ministry, our ministry at our church, but she's a great asset to me as we begin to seek this office. So we begin to pray about that. 